Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then... You ain't black. Welcome back to Outlaws and Gunslingers with your host, Bang and Dang Mafia Edition, Outlaws and Gunslingers, as we move toward a new world order <laughs> and uh, the Genovese crime family. As uh, just like before with Vito, after Gigante goes to prison, he has a couple of uh, acting bosses um, under him, and the first of which is Dominic Cirillo, who uh, a longtime member of the family. A matter of fact, was the son of a made man. Um, is that he's a just movie? Son of a made man. <laughs> Could be. Son Should of a preacher be. Man. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dominic Quiet um, Cirillo, his daddy was in the old mafia for before him. He was born July 4th, 1929 in East Harlem. He's a high-ranking member, I would assume high-ranking since he was the boss, right. who briefly served as a acting boss for the uh, Genovese family when, uh, like I said, Vinny went to jail. He was born uh, to Colombo crime family capo uh, Alphonse Cirillo, who served as a made man under Joseph Magliocco. When it was the Profacy crime family. Hmm. Alphonse was a first-generation Italian-American immigrant from Potenza Basilicata, Italy, 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 <laughs> Italy. 1961, his father was implicated in the attempted murder of Lawrence Gallo, a brother of fellow Profacy crime family soldier Joey Gallo. I don't know sure. wonder what made him switch. Why are they uh, find out. trying to hit their own guys, huh? You know usually how it goes. Well, Alphonse, Carmine, Persico, and Salvatore de Ambrosio were the suspected attempted moiters, of, but Gallo refused to cooperate. No one was charged in the attack. Of course. His father died of unknown causes sometime before 1963, but was later made infamous after he was one of the hundreds of organized crime figures named in the testimony of mob turncoat Joseph Vellecci. Well, I don't think... He was made infamous if there's one of hundreds. Right. And he's dead, so. Right. His father, Alphonse, through his lifetime, had succeeded in never being arrested for a single criminal act, except for criminally receiving, as an early 1960s era organized crime mob family chart had stated. What? Criminally receiving? What does that mean? Receiving like stolen property? Or Maybe, right. He is the brother of Gaetano. They called him Wieg Cirillo, and the father-in-law to mob associate John Caggiano. Caggiano. Oh, this dude is just all in the family. Dominic grew up on East 117th Street in East Harlem. And as a teenager, he dropped out of Benjamin Franklin High School. He said, I don't need high school. Right. He was an amateur boxer. Okay, they all are, huh? Who boxed at neighborhood youth clubs and briefly pursued a career as a professional middleweight boxer. He was a husky man who stands at 5'10 and grew to be almost 200 pounds by the 90s. Dang. He was a close personal friend. Dang. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> he, he was a close personal friend and criminal partner of Vincent Gigante from a young age who would later become heir to the Genovese crime family of which Dominic served in, clearly. Mob soldier Frank, Frank California Condo, and Federico Giv Giovanelli often laughed at Dominic's choice of clothing attire that was said to be reminiscent of Emmett Kelly's clown suit. Oh, shit. He liked him some uh, flashy outfits, huh? Oh, jeez. Um, dressed like a bum? Like a bum. I guess, right? That's what he looks like to me. Mm. All right, yeah. He's wearing blackface. Uh -huh. All right, good for him. Drunk clown or something? Dumb. Is that what he is? All right, 1949, Dominic, who was at the time, was 20... Was 20 year old welterweight. He was knocked out in three matches. Oh, jeez. Had one match drawn before retiring. 1953, at the age of 23, he pleaded guilty to overseeing a clandestine heroin trafficking ring that was said to have grossed up to $20,000 a day in 1940. <laughs> That's money, money, money. For his drug trafficking conviction, he served nearly four years in a federal correctional institution in Milan. That's in Michigan. Huh. Milan, Milan, Michigan? Milan, yeah. Cool. Before he returned to East Harlem afterwards. I wonder why they sent him all the way there. Between 1958 and 1965, he was arrested four times for consorting with known criminals, which were all later dismissed. Jeez. Oh, this guy's still alive, by the way. Uh, he's married to an Italian-American woman named Bella, who bore him two children, Nicholas and Anne-Marie. Whenever fellow criminal associates would want to mention Cirillo's name, they used an adapted clandestine sign language 
where they put their finger to their lips, which would mean they were discussing Dominic because he was the quiet Dom. So you got the chin toucher and the lip toucher. All right. He claimed to be <laughs> he claimed to be a retired construction worker and said to live off a of five hundred ten dollars a month in social security checks. Damn. He lived in the country club section, but he lives in a country club. Right. Country club section of Northeast Bronx near Pelham Bay Park and East Chester Bay. All right. Fantastic. Dominic started out as a boxer with future Genovese crime family boss Thomas Evely as his manager and a world heavyweight champion Tommy Ryan worked as his trainer. Look at that. Fantastic. Cirillo gradually drifted towards the criminal side of the neighborhood, though, along with another boxer and associate, Vincent the Chin Gigante. Mm-hmm. As a boxer, he weighed between 151 and 156. He was unsuccessful professional middleweight boxer in 1949. He tried, though. His first professional fight was against Matt Ward on the 9th of March, 1949, and held, that was held at Westchester County Center in White Plains, New York, which he lost. Fought Emerson Charles on March 23rd, also at the Westchester County Center. All right, but well, then he fought Bobby Holt at Manhattan Center. Hey, that's where uh, mm-hmm. the Raws used to be. Mm-hmm. On April 6th, 1949, he then fought Mike Gillow at the New Haven Arena in New York Haven, Connecticut on May 4th, 1949. Jeez, dude, he's fighting like once a month. And Johnny Cohan at Laurel Garden Arena in Central Ward, Newark, New Jersey. Okay. During his short-lived boxing career, he boxed 16 rounds and lost three matches, withdrew from one, and won just one single match. Eh, what are you going to do? He suffered two knockouts by Matt Ward on March 9th, which was also his first professional match, once again by Emerson Charles on March 23rd, 1949. All right. His one disqualified match was against Bobby Holt. I wonder what he did. Low blow? Maybe. His first conviction came in 1952 when he was in prison on narcotics charges. In subsequent years, he grew closer to Gigante, who was seen in the mid-1980s as the de facto boss of the Genovese crime family. While Gigante served as boss on the streets, Sorello served in a messenger between Gigante and the other capo regimes of the Genovese crime family. As Cirillo's low-key style earned him his nickname, Quiet Dom. And it also helped him avoid the gaze of the authorities for many, many years. Well, like we said, after Gigante was in prison in 1997 for racketeering and conspiracy charges, leadership of the family passed to a committee ruling, just like it did for, uh, when Vito went to prison, which was known as the administration, ostensibly led by Cirillo. Okay. In this capacity, Cirillo represented the Genoveses in their dealings with the other mafia families of New York, though Gigante remained in overall charge. Right. In this way, Cirillo served as the acting boss and was seen by U.S. authorities as the most powerful member of the family. Of course he did. However, in 1998, Cirillo stepped down as acting boss because of a heart attack and recovered his position as the capo in the family that same year. So he's like, I don't want to be the boss no more, but I'll, I'll still right. still want a racket or two. Right. I still want to oin. I still want to oin. I want to earn. From New York Times article on the 15th of September 1997, it reads, For decades... Dominic V. Cirillo has thrived on obscurity, shunning the trappings of wealth and influence. He lives in an attached house in the Bronx, drives himself around town in modest cars, and has told neighbors that he turned to construction work after flopping as a pro boxer. Now, law enforcement officials say, Mr. Cirillo, known as Quiet Dom, has vaulted to the summit of organized crime in America after studiously maintaining a low profile for decades in the mob. Well, the officials say in former's reports and electronic eavesdropping show that Mr. Cirillo has emerged as the heir to Vincent Gigante as the head of the family, um, which is America's largest and wealthiest mafia family, apparently. Oh. Mafia experts say they believe that Mr. Cirillo, age 67, took command of the family with some reluctance because his ascension makes him a primary target for federal and Obviously. state law enforcement agencies. Clearly. Right. Well, as a boss, he automatically gets more money and a piece of everybody's action in the family. But today... There is one major disadvantage, said Frederick Martins, a mafia expert who has tracked Mr. Cirillo for 30 years. Jeez. You may be at the pinnacle of power, but the top of but the top echelons of law enforcement gear up and turn their sights on you. They sure do. That's what uh, Mr. Frederick Martin said again. In July, Mr. Gigante, who is 69 years old at this point, who is known as Chin, a nickname derived from an Italian name, Vincenzo, he was convicted of racketeering and expiring to kill John Gotti, the boss of the rival Gambino crime family. Mr. Gigante's relatives, asserting that he has been mentally incompetent for about 20 years, deny that he is a mobster. He's like, he's not a mobster. He can't even think for himself. Right. But the defense lawyers failed after a six-year-long battle to block the trial of Mr. Gigante, which we covered last week. All right. Yeah. Yeah. 
who is awaiting sentencing in Frederick Prison in Hospital of Butner, New North Carolina. <laughs> New, New Carolina. <laughs> New Carolina. Federal and state law enforcement officials say the convictions of Mr. Gigante and three other members of the Genovese hierarchy earlier this year catapulted catapulted Mr. Cirillo abruptly from his rank as capo or right. captain to acting boss. Right. He is an influential figure, and he has been running the family's day-to-day operations for some time, said Louis D. Cirillo. Shaliro, the head of the Federal Bureau of Investigations Criminal Division in New York. Uh, FBI agents and state investigators say Mr. Cirillo controls 200 to 250 made or initiated soldiers and capos, mainly in the New York City region. Nice. And about a thousand associates who, uh, obviously, who, well, this is the article, so. Right. A thousand associates, people who knowingly work or cooperate in the gangs to rackets. Under Mr. Gigante's reign, the Genovese family supplanted the Gambino, Gambino Group as the nation's largest and most powerful mafia faction, investigators say. Right, supposedly. Okay, so we got the Genovese family's financial bedrock is illegal gambling and loan sharking, which bring in hundreds of millions of dollars each year. Man. According to federal, New York, and New Jersey law enforcement officials, that's what they say. Other illegal activities in which the family is said to be entrenched in, 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 in include extortion for labor peace in the construction in, industry and from businesses at Port Newark and Port Elizabeth in New Jersey. You know, they're on the ports. They got everything. Mm. In the last five years, indictments and city regulatory crackdowns have weakened the Genovese family strangleholds over businesses and unions in the region's private garbage removal industry. Yeah, of course. The Fulton Fish Market, the Jacob K. Javits Convention Center, and the Feast of San Gennaro. Everything, literally. Right. State and federal investigators say Mr. Gigante appointed Mr. Cirillo as the family's acting boss last year, pending the outcome of his federal trial, and had sanctioned Mr. Cirillo's takeover of the top spot. Oh. Cirillo may not like the problems and attention thrust on him, but he knows more about the family's operations than anyone else and is the last surviving member of Chin's inner circle, oh. said a senior state official who spoke on the condition of anonymity. Why? Why are you a senior state official? Right. Mr. Cirillo, who has an unlisted phone number, he did, <laughs> he did not respond for requests for an interview and letters <laughs> mailed to his home and left with his son, Nicholas <laughs> of course he's not going to respond to your interviews oh uh, yeah son nicholas yeah he wasn't responding either and mr cirillo's not gonna mr cirillo his wife bella and their son live in a two-story yeah, house throwing this guy all out there right in a largely blue collar country club section of northeast bronx near pelham bay park and east chester bay how can they say things like this about my father that he's a mafia boss said nicholas cirillo 37 mm-hmm. years old he also said he said that in, a, in an impromptu interview in the narrow driveway of the Cirillo home, pointing to the red brick building with white shingles. He said the house was sorely in need of repairs. He says, "Look at this house. Look at it. We don't have money to fix a drain pipe for or the roof, and the washing machine in the basement leaks." Mr. Cirillo said that if he had money and such a big shot, we would be living. We would not. We would be. Ooh, would we be living like this? <laughs> there it is. Yeah, if you want to. Uh... Avoid the spotlight. Right. Nicholas Cirillo said that his father bought the house for $40,000 in 1974 and that the mortgage was fully paid. Well, there you go. His father, the son, insisted as a retired construction worker and survives mainly on $510 a month from Social Security. Mm-hmm. Investigators who have tracked Dominic Cirillo for years say he has recently become more reclusive and has not been seen in restaurants and social clubs where he usually met with suspected underworld allies. No. In the past, he was occasionally seen at the wakes, weddings, and christenings of wise guys, oh. an investigator said. Since Chin's conviction, he appears to have gone underground. Yeah, because he doesn't want nothing to happen to him. Yeah, damn right. Wow. Asked recently about his father's whereabouts, old Nicholas Sorrell said, he's at the beach. <laughs> he, he declined to be more specific, but hey, he's at the beach, bud. Dominic Cirillo, according to court and federal prison records, he grew up on, we already said all this shit. Well, this is the article, man. Oh. Uh, we all know he grew up on East 117th Street in East Harlem, and as a teenager, teenager he dropped out of Benjamin Franklin High School. Uh, he was fast with his fists, but not fast enough to win in a boxing match. <laughs> <laughs> he fought in amateur boxing, as we said, at neighborhood youth clubs. Uh, also, so did Mr. Gigante, and he briefly turned professional, which did not work out for, for Mr. Sorello. But Mr. Gigante won 21 out of 25 bouts. The young Mr. Cirillo's ring career ended in a quick failure, though. 1949, Mr. Cirillo, a 20-year-old welterweight, was knocked out in three bouts. One draw before retiring from the ring. 
Let's keep on beating ourselves. Okay, New York Post or whatever this is from. Mr. Sprillo's only significant conviction occurred in 1953 when at the age of 23 he <laughs> pleaded guilty to state and federal charges of running a heroin trafficking ring. He served almost four years at the federal penitentiary in Milan, Michigan before returning to East Harlem. Between 1958 and 65, he was arrested four times on charges. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was arrested for narcotics. After that arrest, Cirillo maintained a very low profile for decades, says Mr. Martins, who was a former director of the Pennsylvania Crime Commission and former chief of the Intelligence Bureau of the New Jersey State Police. Mm. He must have been very adept at political infighting because the Genovese, like most families, will not advance anyone with a drug record. Right. That's a lie. Mr. Martin said mob leaders were reluctant to associate with convicted narcotics traffickers because they attract additional law enforcement surveillance. Oh, yeah. Mrs. Cirillo came to the attention of the FBI in the mid-80s when the Bureau began an intensive investigation of a gigante who was then the undisputed boss. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, it says, we got on to Cirillo because he was always around the chin and had direct access to him, said John Pritchard. I wonder how many times I tried to talk to him. I was like, hey, man, give us some info. Right. He, John Pritchard's a supervisor of the FBI's Genovese squad. Oh, damn, they got a Genovese squad. Oh, of course they do. From 83 to 1987. Even back then, said Mr. Pritchard, now the public safety commissioner in White Plains. He said, even back then, you could tell from the deference given him by other mobsters that he was a comer. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh my god <laughs> I, I can't stop But it feels so good <laughs> <laughs> And he was clearly an important player in the game yeah, But he was Mr. Pritchard described Mr. Cirillo as a husky 5 foot 10 inch Weighing 200 pound fella And he was also an elusive prey Who relied on walk talks Whispering with associates while strolling on noisy streets Rather than talking on telephone or inside social clubs I think that's pretty smart Right where federal agents could secretly record their conversations. Not today, Charlie. Well, it's not secretly if they know. Right. Um, he would leave his home in the Bronx every day, Mr. Pritchard said, make a stop in East Harlem to visit relatives and then drive downtown and park his car on the east side or in Midtown. On foot, he usually had an escape hatch. Right. Why not? Oh, he would go into a building or a restaurant that had more than one entrance and try to lose us. Mr. Swillow is adept at spotting surveillance cars, Mr. Pritchard said. He would drive onto a highway and abruptly pull over to the side. If we stopped or slowed down, he had us made and he was behind us on our tail. On our tail. Right. Mr. Martins noted that the Genovese family has long been the dominant force on the Mafia's commission, the body that resolves major disputes among mobsters. As the Genovese godfather, Mr. Martin said, Cirillo in the, in the effect is the most important crime boss in America, the leader of the commission that oversees all Mafia families. I mean, dude. I give it to uh, organized crime because they know these sons of bitches are being watched. I mean, they spot the uh, the lookout car while they're doing their deals. I know, <laughs> and then just let them follow them around town. I, mean, I guess they try to lose them sometimes, but that rarely happens. It's just ridiculous, and just continue on to do well, what you do. Especially they know the dude's the boss. The boss ain't doing nothing, right? Stupid like that. Wow, Cirillo's son, Nicholas, who was not believed to be a made man, he disappeared on the 9th of May in 2004. What? Oh. Nicholas left home and told his wife he was going to Home Depot to buy a compound. He did not return. On the 10th of May, his wife, Gina, filed a missing persons report. On uh, 23rd of May, the New York Daily News reported the rumors regarding Nicholas's disappearance. They were reporting that he was murdered by the banana mobsters. Oh. According to their mob source, two weeks before his disappearance, Nicholas went to a real estate office in Pelham Bay. He got into a fight with Vincent Bassiano Jr., the son of Vinny Gorgeous Bassiano at the time. He was the acting boss of the Bonanno crime family. Oh. And he got into a fight with Bonanno Capo Dominic Sakel. He wanted to start pushing around made guys, and now he's gone, said one organized crime investigator. We don't think he was going to resurface. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> think he quite literally means right. resurface. All right. It was believed that Dominic Cirillo would avenge his son. But the New York Daily News reported that he was unhappy with his son for building a rap sheet of minor drug offenses. Mm. Three weeks later, his abandoned car was discovered, but Nicholas Cirillo was never found. He's never been found. You think they would kill him and not tell his dad? No. Investigators believe the younger Cirillo was killed after he insulted the son of acting Bonanno crime family boss. Right. right. Uh, it remains unclear whether this would have been allowed to happen without the explicit permission of Dominic Cirillo. Right. Sources in 2007. 10 say that Dom ordered the death of Nicholas on Mother's Day of 2004. On December 4, 2004, Randolph Pizzolo, who allegedly bragged about his role in the murder and disappearance of Nicholas, was found shot to death. Oh, shit. You tell me, oh, uh, Dominic killed his son? Could be. Oh, my. 
After a tape implicating him was played at the Brooklyn Federal Court trial of Joseph Massi- Massino, the mafia's highest rank in supergrass. What the fuck is a supergrass? <laughs> I don't know. This is from the Daily Mail. I don't know. Uh, the court heard a conversation in January of 2005 between Massino and Vincent Bassiano, or Vinnie Gargis, the father of the gangster Nicholas was said to have had a battle with in the Bronx. Massino secretly recorded a discussion for the police. Oh, what a piece of garbage this guy is. <laughs> when as who whacked the mobster's son, Nicholas Bassiano, can be heard saying, oh, that came from Dom. That that came from Dom. Oh. oh. When pressed in court by prosecutor Ter- prosecutor Taryn Mer- Merkel to explain the comments, Messino said, I understand that he's telling me quiet Dom killed his son. The footage also shows Messino gesturing with his hand like a gun while asking Bassi- B- uh, Bassiano, do we have anything to do about that? Meaning Nicholas's uh, murder. Bassiano replies, absolutely not. Come on. Bassiano. Bassiano is then heard telling Messino that he met with Dominic Cirillo about the altercation with Nicholas. He said the Genovese family came back and apologized to me. Hmm. Ooh, maybe it did happen, dude. I mean, it is thought Nicholas's death would have been ordered because of the fracas in the Bronx two weeks before. Assaulting a main member of the man. Is that a movie? What? Fracas in the Bronx. <laughs> it should be. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Assaulting a made member of the mafia carries the penalty of death. It does, especially when you're not even a made guy yourself. Right, yeah, I mean, I get it. But investigators finally believe they might have got to the bottom of what happened to the family mobster Nicholas Cirillo. His death may have been ordered by his own father. Mm, Quiet Dom is said to have refused to cooperate with police in trying to trace him. Now has been suggested that Quiet Dom may ruthlessly have ordered his son's murder after a tape implicated him was played. Yes, we know. Right. Well, it seems incomprehensible that a father would order the murder of a son because of this rule. The two were estranged. And Messino explained to the court that mafia codes are taken very seriously. They are. They are. Messino described how in his days as a mobster, he gave the order to kill Banano Capo, Gerlando Shasha, even though they got on well because Shasha had murdered the son of a made man in Canada. Nicholas's disappearance would have led to ramifications from his family as the son of a mafia boss. Killing him would carry a death penalty, right? Bonanno turncoat James Tartaglione said, if you kill a mafioso's son, you're liable to start a war between families, right? But after Nicholas Cirillo vanished, there was no war. Right. Yeah, that's true. Wow. October 18, 2005, Cirillo, who again was recognized acting boss for Gigante and four Genovese capos, Lawrence Little Larry Dentico, 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 something, and John Johnny Sausage Barbado, oh, wow. and Anthony Tico Antico. <laughs> why, didn't, why didn't they call it Dentico Tico? <laughs> what the hell? They pleaded guilty on charges of racketeering and racketeering conspiracy. All right. All of them did? Apparently, yeah. Even Dominic? Federal agents arrived at Sorello's home. They took him by surprise. Agents said they found a piece of paper on the kitchen table with the names of five men who were proposed for membership for the... Oh, no. Why would you leave them on papers? All right. Proposed memberships of the, the crime family. It has also become known that when mobsters discuss Sorello, they wouldn't say his name. <laughs> Instead, they would put his finger on the lips, <laughs> indicating they're talking about old quiet down Cirillo. Yes, sir. A week after being arrested, Cirillo asked for a court-appointed lawyer. Oh, wow. Cirillo claimed he was too poor to afford a lawyer and asked for the court to appoint one. Cirillo's registered income consists of $600 a month now in Social Security. Hey, Look at he jumped it up. It was furthermore Guys. said right, that he gave his modest house on Research Avenue in the Bronx to his now-missing son, Nicholas, five years ago. Oh. When Cirillo was arrested, he was living with his daughter, Anne Marie, in her summer home. Her summer home? At Long Beach, Long Island. What does she do? She got her summer home. Wow. Oh. Living with his daughter. Can't spend none of his money. Right. You know he got it. Jeez. Cirillo was sentenced to 48 months prison and forced to pay $75,000 restitution. August 22nd, 2008. 79-year-old Cirillo was released from federal prison after serving more than three years. After being acting boss following the death of longtime uh, godfather Vincent Gigante in December 2005, Sorello began to serve as the consigliere of the Genovese crime family. Yep. It appears they had stepped down in 2015 to allow former street boss Peter Petey Red D. Chiara to serve as the consigliere. So now he's nothing, right? He's gone. He gave up the life, apparently. Probably not, though. You know, he's making some coin somewhere, doing something. He probably gave it up, so now he can actually spend his money. Right. Though, yeah, right. Got to spend it sometime. Can't pass it on to his son. <laughs> <laughs> pass it on to his daughter. As long as she don't slap some... Uh... All right, made man. Right. Yeah. That's going to do it for old Quiet Dom Cirillo's story. Uh, next week, 
We'll probably have, uh, we got two more mob bosses, well, three more, technically. Next up, probably next week, we'll have uh, another twofer, as we have Maddie, uh, the horse, Ionello, who was, look at that guy, who was uh, around the same time. And then uh, also we'll probably do Daniel, Danny, the Lion, Leo. And then we'll probably end with the bosses who, with the current boss, supposedly, uh, Laborio Barney Belomo. Who is the current and acting boss, not acting, official boss of uh, the family right now, so they say. Mm. And then as far as street bosses, we've done everybody. We didn't do Salerno yet. Maybe we'll get him. Or Frankie Thierry. We didn't do him either. Maybe we got something on him, huh? Mm. Daniel Pagano, maybe? Mm. Um, yeah, there's a couple left from here, but not too many. There's a lot left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot left. Antico, the Dentico, Ralph, the Undertaker, Balsamo. Uh -huh. All right, yep, that'll do it for old Quiet Dom Cirillo. I mean, this we might make it to like 28 minutes for this episode. Not bad. Yeah, what are you going to do? They're not all going to be bangers. <laughs> <laughs> bangers and mash. But uh, at least you guys hear about the little-known mobsters that nobody ever talks about. Right. Go online. You can't find nothing about this freaking guy. So I wonder why we did repeat ourselves 20 times in the, right. uh, in the article. So, yep, that's it for uh, Cirillo. Go check out um, our other podcasts, according to Wikipedia, where this week's episode is going to be about The Hobbit. Mm. <laughs> mm. Hey, it's the book, The Hobbit. We spin a random wheel. Um, and we, spin a wheel oh, we spin a wheel with a bunch of random uh, Wikipedia pages, whatever it lands on. We read our uh, previous episodes have been sexual intercourse, climate change, and of course we read about the uh, actual Wikipedia page. Right. And uh, we're only like five episodes in, so... And then the week after that, we'll do, um, I think it's Napoleonic, 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 Napoleonic Wars. That'll be a long episode. So go check that out wherever you get your podcasts. And also Battles of the American Civil War, where we are in the middle of 1863. And the Confederates are about on their last legs here. But we still got a lot of war left. Don't know how, but we do. Hmm. And, uh. Also on the Bang Dang Network on YouTube, where you can find all three of these podcasts. And we shall be back next week for more Outlaws and Gunslingers. We are the Mother Music Industry. Bang Dang. <laughs>